So welcome everyone to this uh, installment of the Development Humanitarian Dialogues, a series put on by the Development Humanitarian Research Group and the Center for Humanitarian Leadership at Deakin University. Really, really pleased to be here with you all today to be discussing Dr. Joe Kropp's latest book, The Humanitarian Fix. But before we um, kick off, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we all are, we're gathered virtually. Um, so those for me are the Warren Jerry people of the Kula Nation, but maybe different for those of you in uh, different areas. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. So today we have the absolute delight of hearing Joe present about his book, The Humanitarian Fix, which was published recently. Um, and I can, I can drop a link to it in the chat as well so people have access to that. But pretty simple format today, we're gonna begin um, with, with Joe's presentation, and then we're gonna hear insights from our two discussants, Yvette and Max. And finally, there will be time for Q&A, so I encourage people to put questions in the chat. But actually, we're quite a, a nice um, little intimate group, so I think people could also just, uh, you know, when it comes to the Q&A, it would be really lovely to even just get a discussion going. So feel free to drop things in the chat as you go. I think it's always nice as people have um, thoughts arise to have a place to put them. But then also as we move into that um, q and I think it would be really great to have a little bit more of a kind of discussion format as well. So I'm gonna introduce our, our main speaker, our main presenter, Dr. Joe Kropp, and then I'm gonna introduce our two discussion, uh, two discussants, uh, Yvette Zegenhagen and Mac, Associate Professor Max Kelly. So first, Dr. Joe Kropp is an independent researcher and delegate with the International Red Cross Red Crescent. He is uh, a researcher in humanitarian and development studies, and his book, The Humanitarian Fix, which we'll hear about today, combines ethnography and critical theory to examine how civilian protection works in contemporary wars. He's an experienced communications professional and researcher, skilled in humanitarian communications, community engagement, and translating research into policy. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in International Politics and Journalism, a Master of Journalism and a Master's of Development, and earned his PhD from the University of Melbourne in 2019. Joe, it's great to have you here with us today. Before I hand over to you, I'll also introduce our two discussants. So we have the pleasure today of being joined by Yvette Zegenhagen, the Head of International Humanitarian Law at the Australian Red Cross. Yvette is a member of the executive team at the Australian Red Cross and leads their International Humanitarian Law Department. The department provides training, large-scale campaigns, public dissemination, and targeted law and policy advocacy with government and other critical stakeholders within Australia. Yvette's the chair of Australia's National IHL Committee and a member of the editorial board of the International Review of the Red Cross. She holds a Bachelor of International Relations and a Bachelor of Laws from Bond University, as well as a Master's in International and Community Development from Deakin University. Last but not least, Associate Professor Max Kelly, who's Associate Professor of International and Community Development at Deakin, and also the course director of the International and Community Development and Sustainable Development and Humanitarian Action courses. Her areas of expertise include international and community development policy and practice. She has a sectoral focus in food security, food systems, and sustainability at local, national, and international levels alongside a critical focus on global political economy of development and social justice. She holds a PhD in international development from Kingston, a master's in rural and regional resource planning from Aberdeen and a bachelor's in agricultural science from Dublin. So welcome everyone and a huge thanks to our uh, presenter and discussants. And this is gonna be a really, really wonderful opportunity to delve a little bit more into the humanitarian fix. So without further ado, Joe, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Nazanin, for the introduction. And before I start, I'd just like to um, acknowledge the importance of interdisciplinary conversations like this. As an interdisciplinary scholar, there's few forums to bring different people together from these different schools. But when we do, they become really rewarding. Now, I'll just start up my slide here. Can you see that, Nazanin? No, I can't see that. I'm, I'm seeing those. 
and we, we had we just we just tested it so of course <laughs> um do you want to give it another shot or do you want me to because i also have it pulled up on my screen so i could also share it if um oh but now i'm starting to see something from your Good stuff end. thank you yeah, there we go okay just to introduce my research more broadly i'm interested in both the laws of protection, but more importantly, how they actually work. How do they unfold in the field in complex environments? And that was, that was the foundation of my studies. Um, just wanting to know the everyday practice of the delegates who use these laws and implemented these laws in the field. But before I go on to explore more of that, it's just worth at the outset pausing for a moment and just to identify what protection involves, what humanitarian protection involves in today's conflicts. And it remains a legal area. Protection is about the law. So um, it revolves around international humanitarian law which guides the behaviour of actors in armed conflict. Under that or next to that, we also have international refugee law and international humanitarian rights law. And these legal frameworks form a structure that guides the behaviour of different actors in armed conflict. Now, these have been around a long time. They date back uh, to the 1800s but essentially they remain the same today. They've evolved slowly, but they essentially remain the same today. And they're used across the spectrum. So when we talk about um, how humanitarians guide their behaviour and guide their policies and guide their practice, it revolves around these legal frameworks when we're talking about protection. So for the International Committee of the Red Cross, their practices are guided by international humanitarian law. UNHCR, of course, turns to refugee law. NGOs have followed these two organisations, and you'll see that their own protection policies and practices sit under these as well. So in the end, they're all using these legal frameworks to provide like a united approach to how the protection of civilians works in armed conflict. And this goes right back to the very definition that we all often turn to. Our protection, as it says there, is all activities aimed at ensuring the rights of the individual in accordance with the letter and the spirit of the relevant body of law. Now, the world has changed over time since um, since these laws were developed. So if we reflect back on international humanitarian law, it was a state-based project that emerged out of, Euro, um, out of Europe and then has been slowly transported or um, transferred across the world. And it kind of followed the states as they kind of went out from Europe as well. So it's this um, state idea based on legal frameworks. It's been adapted and developed over time, but essentially it's still that same overarching legal, agree uh, legal agreement that works in today's conflicts. Similarly with refugee law, which emerged in Europe following World War II, it's very much a legal project. Again, it's been nuanced over time, but it's still that same legal piece of work. Now, there's been critiques around this, and there are many of them kind of critiquing this um, project, explaining how it's happened. If you look at um, post-colonial literature, they'll talk about how those power structures have been sustained over time. Um, policy literature calls, uh, uh, talks about the policy trap, how we keep on going back to the same policies to find solutions. And that can be... Um, reflected in these legal frameworks. But I'm not necessarily going to go into that. As I've said, I'm simply curious about how these legal frameworks, which are defined as universal, actually work. 
how are they implemented in these complex environments which inv now involve a multitude of actors, often from different cultural, legal and political traditions? It, it, it's, um, I come to this just with a sense of curiosity to see what happens in the field, what happens with everyday practice to make these legal frameworks work. Now, to answer that question, and it's why we can bring IHL and development studies together, I turn to ethnography, um, which has a long history and most recently in development studies. Um, development ethnographers have explored the complexity of, of international development and how these um, different organisations and different institutions interact to explain those interactions. So for my research, I've done ethnographic field work. So I've made some observations, uh, mainly in Iraq during my time there. It's largely been built on some 40 interviews with protection delegates with experience around the world. So I've spoken to them to get their everyday experiences. And then I've drawn in, um, in critical theory. In particular, I've turned to um, David Moss, who explored policy and practice and that complex world of development and how rather he found policy did not necessarily drive practice, but instead he found it was driven by a set of relationships. He also, um, he also turned to Deserto and Scott, which I've done as well and ideas of agency, which not only talk to the top-down agency of institutions, but also talk to the agency of individuals as they push back against these uh, uh, institutions and adapt things to suit their own needs. So from that, from those, um, from those interviews, from those observations, and grappling with that critical theory, how does protection work? The central question that I ask. And from this, I've come up with a broad model. So I would argue that relationships drive protection. We have a complex mix of actors on the ground and protection occurs when these different actors come across a mutually beneficial consensus that benefits the protection of civilians. Now, this has been around for a long time. I would argue that IHL in its very foundations is, a, is an agreement with a few diverse actors between humanitarians and between states and between civilians themselves to come up with a broad agreement of behaviour that benefits civilians. So by that, for me, relationships drive protection. And in that, I kind of reflect on Moss, who says a similar thing about policy and development. Now, I'm not saying the legal frameworks don't matter, because they clearly do. They're an important component of humanitarian protection. But I come at them from a slightly different angle. These legal frameworks, I argue, act as a unifying narrative. They provide a common story that brings these different actors together with a similar belief, an overarching agreement on how they should behave. So a unifying narrative that brings this disparate group together often heading in directions with different needs and aims and provides them with an agreement on how they can move forward that benefits the protection of civilians. The important step to this in today's wars is this agreement originally involved a small number of actors. It was a state agreement between states, their militaries, and humanitarians. In modern conflict, there are many more actors involved. 
So this is where humanitarian agency comes in. So those humanitarian actors on the field, protection delegates, ICRC dissemination officers, there's a whole range of them who bring their own agency to this engagement. And they're central to the frameworks transferring across to very different contexts. So just to briefly discuss this agency, humanitarians work in a number of ways. Firstly, they have their official role. So the classic would be the ICRC dissemination officer. They share the legal frameworks as they're meant to be, and they get people on board. They inform, they educate, they talk about these roles. So people come in and sign on to these frameworks, and many organisations have them. And by intermediary, they don't translate things. They just explain how they are. There's no translation in the process. It's this is what they are, and they share them. And it works. It's worked for a long time. It's brought a lot of actors in to this, into this narrative. But they also have an, un, an unofficial role as brokers and translators. So because there's a complex mix of actors in this environment, they engage with these different actors and translate these official frameworks so they match up with different political and cultural groups. So they come with different logical arguments. They come with different moral arguments to bring these different actors into the framework. They're not saying follow something else. They're just putting forward different reasons why people should belong to this group, why people need to follow this narrative. The third part is who are these people? And this is kind of, um, I've, I've identified the, them as humanitarian travellers because to do these two things, you need to both have a strong understanding of the legal frameworks, how they work and where they sit in the world, and you need a strong understanding of these different cultures you're engaging with, these different groups you're engaging with, to interpret that knowledge for that different audience. And I found they gain this through travel. For this informal knowledge, there's no real formal school, so they build that knowledge through experience on the ground, talking to others and engaging with others. And that is what I call the humanitarian fix, what has allowed these legal frameworks to be effective in these different contexts with different actors. It's kind of allowed them to be broader, more flexible and engage in these new contexts. There are a few things to remember though. It's a temporary fix. So it provides the fix for that moment, for that point in time. And because these actors evolve and change, it needs to be, um, to be reapplied. I've borrowed this from Harvey and his spatial fix. And like him, it's like it both fixes the problem temporarily, but it's also like a drug fix. You have to keep on reapplying it for it to work. The other important thing to remember is these are two different scripts. And then I reflect on Scott as well, who um, talked about official and unofficial transcripts. The official language, which in this case is what the intermediaries talk about, which is international humanitarian law, international refugee law, and the unofficial language, which are these side conversations that go on. Now, the official script is important. It works. It's worked for a long time. It works in a state system, which is kind of what dominates the world we are in. It works for a lot of these actors a lot of the time because a lot of the time they are state-like actors. So you don't want to undermine that. You want to sustain that and maintain that because of its importance, which is why 
The other script is the unofficial script. It's informal. It's learnt informally. It's implemented informally, and it evolves and uh, as things go along. So, both that allows the official frameworks to work and function, without the the unofficial script undermining them, because. The official frameworks act because they are seen as universal. They apply to everyone. But if you start to push those boundaries too much, it may undermine them. Hence, the two remain separate. So in a relatively short space of time, that's my research, as I've said, which brings in those legal frameworks and seeks to understand them using, using development theory. And with that, I'll end and leave time for the two discussants and hopefully some questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. That is such a thought provoking discussion. I have many, many notes and I may uh, invoke my moderator privileges later to ask the first questions in the Q&A. But before that, I will hand over first to Yvette and then immediately over to Max for uh, some reactions and thoughts from our two discussants. Thanks so much. Um, and I hope you can see me properly. My background is light is a bit odd. Okay, fab. Um, so thanks very much for having me today as um, has been said, I'm, I'm Yvette and um, the Head of International Humanitarian Law for Australian Red Cross. Um, before I get into it, I do want to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, near the beautiful Merry Creek in Melbourne's north. Um, and worth acknowledging that as we're talking about the universal nature of some of these concepts, um, that there is also much that we could and should draw upon um, when we have the privilege of living on the lands of the oldest continuous culture in the world and the traditions um, that exist in terms of protection and um, conflict resolution um, within those cultures. Um, so it is such a delight to be with you this afternoon. Um, Joe and I worked together in the IHL program um, many years ago and um, had lots of discussions about IHL and so it was such a pleasure and an honour to now be asked to sit with you Joe, as a as a recently minted doctor uh, to discuss a book that places IHL and the law under a critical microscope um, as part of the humanitarian protection framework um, and I think it's an important book that you've written because particularly as the humanitarian sector and the structures and bureaucracy and foundations that it's all built upon come under greater scrutiny from the global majority, um, you know, from movements like Black Lives Matter um, to the more humanitarian focused localization agenda. Um, because the laws that have been the scaffolding to this system um, are not and should not be immune from those kinds of critical discussions. And I think a lot of the scholarship around this, it's worth just calling out, it's still through what is ultimately a Western lens um, which, of course, is also your background, Joe. But I think what differentiates you um, from others, um, others that I have read on, on or around these topics is that you don't provide a, a oh, but even so type argument to justify the, the inequality in some of these structures and how that plays out in a protection sense. You lay it all out to bear. Um, that said, I think it's also important that... Um, as a sector, we continue to create opportunities and space for humanitarian workers and actors who don't represent um, the, you know, Western international aid worker or lawyer or whoever it may be flown in and out from Geneva or Australia or Canada or wherever they might hail from. Um, so something I think just your book just was another reminder to me um, that that needs to be at the forefront of all of my thinking. Um, so there are a few points I wanted to pick up from your book, Joe, and I'll focus on the IHL side of things because that's my main point of reference and expertise, but I understand it's, of course, only one ex, um, aspect of your um, exploration in this book. And the first thing I wanted to highlight that I found really interesting is your use of the term restraint, um, which you first speak about in the introduction, but carries through the book, um, particularly in relation to non-state armed groups. 
And it's true that compliance with the laws of war is about restraint. It's restraint from acting in ways that violate these rules and erode human dignity and protection. And you talk about it in very pragmatic terms. This is clearly a book written for practitioners. So in terms of reciprocity, community support, legitimacy. Um, and I just wanted to create a link between the work that you've done here and the work actually of another Australian um, at the ICRC, Dr. Fiona Terry, uh, who has also produced a fascinating study, um, piece of research, I should say, called Roots of Restraint in War. Uh, and it, it's, I think, a complementary piece to what you've spoken about, um, Joe, in your book. So it looks at what leads arms bearers to not commit violations of the law, but act violations of law, but what leads them to restraint or what leads them to decide not to. Um, and she she doesn't look at it quite from the same lens as you, but I think the the similarities are very clear in that she and she looks at a number of different models of, of armed groups um, and says that if you're looking at compliance with the law, if a lawyer or an ICRC delegate or whoever it was comes and talks to you about the law and the Geneva Conventions, your compliance will go up like this to the laws of war. And if someone comes and talks to you as a peer or as a commander and talks about informal um, behaviours and cultures and military culture and belonging to a particular group, your compliance goes up like this. And if you combine the two, suddenly the compliance with the laws um, and the, the restraint that you see from armed groups goes through the roof. Um, so I think it, it goes to your point, Joe, that um, it's not one without the other, but they both serve a purpose and we need to see the validity in marrying the two together and that one without the other is not going to lead to the greatest protection outcomes for people. And what I think is interesting is that it wasn't just in relation to non-state armed groups. It was also important for very hierarchical, ordered, you know, Western concepts of state-run militaries. So I think um, it goes, I guess, to the universality of what drives compliance um, with these laws from very, very different um, cultural um, places. So I'm interested in how we bring those two together. And I think the point you made in your presentation about inter interdisciplinary discussions is a great one. So to give you an example, recently we had, in fact, just last week, we had a um, quarterly meeting of Australia's National IHL Committee, which um, brings together the Red Cross um, and very senior government lawyers from key departments, Defence, Attorney Generals, DFAT, and we talked about COVID-19 and pandemics and IHL, but we didn't bring in a lawyer to talk about IHL and what um, global health practitioners should need. We brought in a um, public health practitioner to talk to us about what lawyers need to, need to know um, in terms of how um, public health experts think about pandemics in the context of armed conflict and what that means and how we marry it up with the law. And I think there needs to be a lot more of that. Um, it gave me great pause for thought, which I think then um, was reflected again in your book, that often when we're talking about the law, it's, well, here I am as an IHL lawyer coming to tell you, humanitarian practitioner, armed forces delegate, um, military commander, whoever you may be, what the law is, and then it's up to you to apply it, rather than having... Um, I know it's shocking to think maybe lawyers don't always have humility, but lawyers having a bit of humility and saying, well, teach me about your culture, um, your organisational cultures, your professional cultures, the behaviours and values that sit behind it that I need to understand in order to interpret what the law might mean for you in a practical sense. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing that's got my mind buzzing a bit, but I'd be interested to hear um, from you as well, other ways that dive, that you go into in your book, but to hear more about, you know, how you bring those two together. Um, I think that leads to another point that I really enjoyed about, in your book about um, the universality or not of IHL. Uh, and I really love that you call out that, yes, there is now a lot of work being done to demonstrate the, the universality of principles of IHL with cultural tradition traditions around the world. But they're often usually, they take the Western system and the Geneva Conventions and all of those beautiful documents that I hold dear to my heart, but they take them as the yardstick against which the adequacy or compatibility of others are measured. 
Um, and it's a bit of a retrofitting exercise. And I think that is just so important to call out. Um, and the best example I can think of is of that is actually the emblem under which I work and derive the authority in which I disseminate IHL, the Red Cross. So there are so many examples from different cultures around the world of a symbol, meaning don't shoot, uh, meaning um, impartial humanitarian protection, meaning I'm not part of the fight, I'm not, tar you know, don't target me. And yet, it's a red cross that we adopt universally as something that was meant to just, you know, sit really comfortably with everyone as a universal symbol, symbol, symbol that everyone could get behind. So the concept itself absolutely is universal, but the, the way in which it's been formalised um, is incredibly Western Eurocentric and that then has created issues in terms of how it plays out um, so I think that um, that is um, really critical for us to think about as well, because I, I do genuinely believe that principles of IHL contain universal concept of concepts of humanity, of respect for the dignity of the individual. Um, I genuinely do believe that, but I also completely agree with the way that it's been formalised, institutionalised, adopted into treaties, completely places international expectations of what these should look like within a, a Western lens, and that is a problem, particularly when you look at where the longest protracted armed conflicts are taking place in the world today, and what that means in terms of the limitations that the law can give in terms of protection. Um, I'm not sure we want to dismantle those structures completely, but Joe, a question for you. I, I'm interested to know if you had any thoughts on how we balance the systems that we already have in place, but bring them into more equal balance with like truly universal concepts of how we think about these laws in a modern context. Um, which leads me to my third point, I've got four. So, um, but the third point I wanted to make um, was about the use of power. So when I was reading your book, it, um, and thinking about, you know, the development of the law along very colonial Western lines, um, it also made me think about power structures. And um, I think, the legal frameworks that um, how they've been built to within dominant old power dynamic, global dynamics. So um, I don't know if this is the done thing or not, I, but I'm actually going to um, mention another book, <laughs> um, not just your own Joe, but again, I think it sits really nicely, um, different, completely different, but sits really nicely alongside what you've written. Um, which is a book called New Power by Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms. And it talks about old and new power. And to me, this just is replicated in global, um, the dynamics of the humanitarian system, but um, broader global um, geopolitical dynamics. So it talks about old power as being, you know, very traditional proven credentials, technical expertise, um, needing to navigate complex and bureaucratic systems, creating exclusivity, power as a currency that's held by a few and distributed versus new power, which is really dispersed. It's universally acceptable through storytelling. It's compelling um, for a personal or group narrative. It can mobilize a crowd. It can influence large groups of people. Um, and it creates a participation premium. And to me, um, what you're talking about in your book is very similar um, to that. And they talk about it in terms of, you know, things like the Black Lives Matter movement to even the, um, the gun lobby in the USA. So not within a humanitarian dynamic, but um, to me, it, it just highlights, I guess, the, the power dynamics that have gone into creating these massive humanitarian bureaucracies and structures and the legal scaffolding that sits around it. But the pushing and pushing of these new power dynamics and these new groups and the ways in which people are affecting change in the world that absolutely flows down into, um, into conflict settings um, that are going to really challenge these structures and how we think about that and, and leverage them to our advantage um, to make this whole system just more equitable in terms of the power balance. Because to me, the the way you're talking about the humanitarian fix, it's these informal systems that, and 
informal new power dynamic dynamics that are having to be used locally because the international power dynamic is so set and um, traditional and heavy um, that you need the two and there's still this massive imbalance between the prioritization and the credibility and authority we give to to both of those when they actually play equally important roles. Um, the final point I wanted to pick up on was Sorry, just is that can I jump in? Sorry, yeah. I'm going to actually ask if we can save that final point just because yeah, we yeah, have sure. an eye on the time and just sure. so that we have enough time for Max's comments. Of course, of course. Um, but you could maybe feel free to put some thoughts in the chat or during the Q and A to come back with of those. Because I think judging from what you've said for your first three points, I'm sure the fourth will be incredibly interesting as well. So apologies to play the no, bad no, I'm moderator. sorry that I no, no, I can talk through what you meant. So I'm very sorry that I took too much time. <laughs> not, not a problem at all. And Max, now then, I'll, I'll hand over to you for your comments. No problems. Thanks, Yvette. Um and thank you very much, Joe. I think as we were saying just before we started, it was actually a pleasure to read that book because it is one of the most readable books I have read in a long time. And I'm sure some of that comes down to um, your background and, 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 and your skills. And some of it just comes down to, I think, a really, a really strong sort of passionate sort of message that you had to get through, which was great. Um, so in terms of the interdisciplinary focus, I really love that and I agree with you. I think that's where the space is for critical discussion sort of come out. And I'm coming into this from a de as a development person, not as a humanitarian. And you talk a little bit about that notion of having legitimacy in terms of where you've been as a traveller. So I will, you know, I, I think it's actually sometimes overly important to, to point that out. Um, probably my most, the, the thing that I found most important about this book was that really deep delve into um, some of the nuances of decisions that are made in the field and how they travel both back up to the system and back down through the field. Um, and this is something I've spent quite a long time looking at. Community members, individuals, whatever, and how they relate to the development system. Um, and David Moss, it's funny, I, when that book came out, it was quite a seminal moment, I think, um, because it really did make you stop and think it's all about whether the development works or doesn't work. But actually the role that that invisible person in the middle, the development worker, he, he spotlighted them in a way that nobody else had really done. And I think that was a really important moment. So that's why I really, I, I quite liked the, um, the idea of your book. Um, but a lot, a lot of it for me was learning um, because I'm not familiar with protection um, and the regulatory side. So I, most of my comments are from the development side. Um, I loved, for me, it was quite an eye-opening moment looking at the Eurocentric nature of the humanitarian system. Um, and again, like Yvette, that comment on violence and restraint was actually quite clarifying. Um, I found that quite, quite, quite a good way in my head of conceptualising what you were talking about, and then sort of understanding some of the complex drivers, the social and the political drivers for um, the processes and, and the ways of engaging with conflict. Um, I think moving through relatively quickly that notion that there's sort of an official script and an unofficial script again was quite a powerful message for me and i think resonates very strongly with discourses around in development in terms of where the power and where the negotiations and where the the massaging of certain kind of interactions and so on the notion of the you know the poor beneficiary receiving aid is, is, is long been replaced with that notion of somebody who will create um allegiances and alliances with various people to, to to get the most out of the aid opportunities that are there, the development opportunities that are there. Um, you know, so if there's a wash project in town, you really need a toilet. It, it, it's quite a funny discourse, but it's a really important one. Um, the notion of the broker and the translator were really fascinating. And I think it, it, to me spoke a lot to the role of the individual. Um, again, spending a lot of time with agricultural extension agents, it's surprising how much impact the individual in any position had in terms of what was happening on the ground, in terms of the impact, how knowledge and information was both translated down and back through to the project. So at, at a very practical level, the notion of a broker, which is quite a political space um, in development, I think, um, and the translator stroke interpreter um, was really, 
really important in looking at notions of relationality, which is the core of this book. It's around how humans create relations, unpack re relations, and how they use that to, to kind of gain what they're sort of trying to gain um, and the complexity of those relations. So that was great. That, that was, you know, coming at the end of the book, I just went, that was, that was just, there were really important things that clarified some aspects of the humanitarian um, side. So then I'm kind of, I want to back in that with some of the questions or attentions, because like Nazanin, oh, at the end of it, every time I, like every next bit of the chapter it came out with like a thousand questions. Um, I don't normally do this, but I've got about 10 pages of scribbled notes, which is really quite fun. <laughs> so that's always a good day. Um, I think one of the tensions for me was that David Moss and David Lewis's work was done at a point in development that was quite specific. The participatory nature of development was still firmly embedded there to the point where you could go into any community and they just say, well, would you like to see our copy of our community map or do you need our problem ranking exercise? Um, it was quite a, a strange time in development and I think their work really, I think, built around that sort of notion of a monolithic development structure, which I think even at that time was being quite strongly challenged and their findings were saying it's not that monolithic structure, it's messy, it's opaque, it's, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's constructed from all of these relationships. So that, that was good, but I think, uh, again, Yvette mentioned this a bit, but the, the changing dynamics, particularly in the development sector, have really challenged that notion of the expat development worker flying in to do work. That's really not a, it's not a concept that is easily swallowable now. So it'd be interesting to see what Moss's work would look like in 2021. So I think there is there is possibly a tension there. I'm not quite sure. Again, that's where my knowledge kind of comes in terms of the theoretical side. Um, the one of the other tensions I found, which was quite interesting, and I think this speaks really strongly to the humanitarian sector, was that the visual perception of your humanitarian actor who's moving through your discourse in, in, as a sort of an opaque person of kind of indeterminate ethnicity, but generally international or foreign, um, but foreign to the shores they're working in. Um, and that notion, you had a really great moment in the text, where I was almost scribbling furiously in the margins. And you said, well, for those readers that are now scribbling furiously in the margins and saying that you can't, you know, they have to be political. I was like going, oh, you got me, <laughs> literally. Um, I think for me, that was almost a little bit of a point where I got onto a roundabout, a conceptual roundabout, and I found it hard to get off because when you're talking about the traveller, and I didn't mention the traveller in the first bit, the traveller, I think for me, was actually quite an interesting section because I was quite challenged by the broker and the translator because they were almost the expat aid worker. And the traveller both took that and kind of opened it up, but also reinforced it because that central notion that to be apolitical and neutral and impartial, you almost have to be a foreigner. You almost have to be transient. You almost have to be the consummate outsider, I think was a phrase that you used. I scribbled that about five times too. Um, so for me, it just, it really asks the question of where is th this binary that the humanitarian system has between the local and the international, between the expat and the foreigner. It, it's a binary that I find really problematic because it positions people within the system and it positions the system. So where do these new, what you call exceptional people come? People who are located in the global south, but who've managed to percolate up through the system. What is the role of the, um, the person on the ground who actually holds the knowledge? Knowledge is a core concept in here and how you translate that knowledge. So the holder of the knowledge is not the humanitarian because in a way they then become no longer apolitical. So I, I got into a bit of, as I said, a, a conceptual roundabout and I wasn't sure where the exit was. And I'm, I'm not sure, I'd, I'd love to know just in general, a kind of a response from you about how you conceptualize, because I think it's an insider view of the system, which is awesome. But I also just, that, that, that to me was a little opaque. Um, so then that comes to my final and probably big question really, is that you, you, you follow the humanitarian principles all the way through. You touch on decolonizing the system, you touch on all sorts of power, power aspects and those principles, which are so challengeable from a political perspective, particularly. So 
in the way that you have to hold an apolitical space and to do that you have to be an international aid worker is there not like a fundamental disconnect almost between shifting the system away from this what everyone review you know quite lazily now says the white savior complex which is a phrase i don't like but it summarizes a whole debate so like does the apolitical cover of the humanitarian worker does it still hold and do the apolitical cover of the humanitarian principles enable that or do they now constrain it so there you go so i've just thrown a lot of things at you it actually pretty much seven minutes straight and i've got about 700 other questions but they're my big ones <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much to, to Max and Yvette. So many questions coming out of, of those um, two remarks. And, and maybe, Joa, I'll throw a third one at you before I hand over back to you to answer uh, maybe Yvette's big question about the balance between Western systems um, and, and other types of systems and Max's uh, remarks on the principles. So I am total, so I have a background in international relations. Um, and part of the reason I really moved my trajectory out of IR into humanitarian studies has been um, my own uh, reticence to view everything as as state centric and to really view states as the main player. But I did I did want to play a little bit of devil's advocate, and I wondered what you would say to someone who is coming from a really realist perspective of states holding power, and how you would you know talk about the relationships between individuals, the state. It is something that, um, you know, protection being something that's negotiated for the benefit of individuals. So I'm curious on what you would say then to a very kind of realist perspective that would say, well, why would the state enter into these negotiations if they, like, what well, not there truly a benefit for the state? Why would it enter into negotiations that would benefit individuals? I'm not saying I agree with that point of view, um, but just to kind of play a, a bit of a devil's advocate and put on a realist hat, which feels terrible. So I'm now going to take it off and hand over to you, Joe, um, for some remarks on those three questions. And again, to our audience, please feel free to, um, you can raise your hand, you can pop in a question in the chat, um, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. So Joe, over to you. So many questions there bouncing around my head. I may grab one or two of them, and then I'll throw back for some more questions. Um, the point that Max made about the sector always bounces between the importance for localization and the importance of the international, and it moves backwards and forwards all the time, kind of after localization, realizing the importance of it, and then there are some disadvantages around ideas of neutrality. So it kind of bounces back. And you go around, there's really no get out from it in the current system. It's a this never ending conversation where we just keep on going backwards and forwards because they both have their advantages and their disadvantages. Looking for answers, there is a way out in some further re uh, research about brokers and brokerage. And there's a French area of study which talks about brokerage clubs and brokerage chains. And instead of having a power imbalance between the different sides and like the international is more powerful than the local in that kind of more one-on-one -on -one relationship, the clubs and chains change that balance and empower the local. And this happens between a group of brokers, each bringing in equally important knowledge to negotiate things and work through things. Now, that at the moment is a thought bubble. It's an idea for future research using the same formats to grapple with those different power structures and how people can interact. And I think it reflects practice on the ground as well. So that's just one thought on that. Can I throw back for another question and then we can roll from there? Yep. Sure, maybe I'll, I'll bounce back to Yvette um, mm -hmm. first to, to restate your question and then yep. Anthony, I'll pop over to mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Um, 
I had a whole bunch. So I'll just, what was the one I was going to ask? Oh, um, I guess on how you balance um, the sort of international old power dynamic and systems we have with the new power informal systems that you talk about um, in a way that actually gives them equal credibility in everyone's eyes and equal importance um, and just, I guess, um, creates a bit more in a, a, yeah. a bit more equality in the power dynamic. Yeah. Like many of the things raised in the book, they're really complex questions. Um, and those power dynamics are almost inherent in the structure we've got. So the official knowledge, the official power is always front and centre. And it tends to sideline that, that informal power, that, um, that informal messaging. So the imbalance is there. At one level, it can be institutional. So institutions realising the importance of this different power and crediting and lifting up that kind of, that, um, that other group of knowledge, that other knowledge source and acknowledging it for the importance it is. Uh, I believe the ICRC is starting to do that. So the field staff are no longer the add-on who brings some clever stories to facilitate what the lawyers are talking about. They're bringing people in to be part of that structure. So I think institutionally there are ways to do it. I think more systematically, there, it's almost hardwired into the way that the system works and operates. Mm. Thank you. Anthony, over to you. Um, I, one question and one really quick point. Um, so, Joe, um, Jonathan Goodhand from SOAS has done some re, uh, work on, uh, on brokers in terms of peace building. Um, and his uh, characterization of, pro, of brokers seems to be more about self enriching individuals rather than necessarily arriving at a fix. So, uh, uh, just, just to throw that out there. But now, my question is, um, is around the, the law as the um, you know, sort of global, uh, what do you call official script um, mm -hmm. and, and so on, you know, the, the global universal concept and so on, uh, and the um, the unofficial script at the, the local level, uh, localised and, uh, and I wonder whether, you know, um, if there's a contrast here between norms and global norms and the application of norms as opposed to law. So my question is whether there's a sense in which the, the framing as law rather than norm uh, adds strength or complicates finding local solutions, localised solutions, that, that's local fix. So does the legal framework, I mean, you said repeatedly that official scripts work. Um, and I'm wondering, and not having read the book, uh, to what extent and how, why, you know, what, what actually works about them? Is it because they're universal, you, uh, accepted as universal norms, or is it because of the legal framework and the legal enforceability? And if it's more about norms, it just is, does the fact that they are framed as law trip up or, or actually help? Mm. <laughs> Reflecting on that, I think they're trying to do a number of things. Yeah, uh, the lawyers will be able to talk um, in more detail about the difference between laws and norms, but I think they're trying to do a number of things. So they work as a legal framework. So they bring that level of authority and gravitas that works in the international system. But then you also talk about them in norms, which gives them more flexibility to a certain extent. So I think, the people I talk to bounce between the two. And I think they choose the way they talk about it, depending on the context they're in and how that helps to kind of push the ideas of what they're trying to present at the time. Um, it doesn't really answer your question, but I think there are benefits in both, both discourses. I have tended to move towards talking about them as norms because it kind of matches my concepts and theories and my ideas of narratives. Yep. A roundabout way of answering the question, which I'll have to think about a bit more. Excellent. I see we're almost nearing the end of our time, but I do see there's a question 
um, that has gotten a, a seconding. So maybe we'll, I'll just pass this final one to you, Joe. It's a very big question. Mm -hmm. So maybe just uh, a bit of a snapshot of an answer if you can in the few minutes that we have left, which is your position on principles, humanitarian principles, particularly mm. neutrality and the many critiques. Um, I've thought about these an awful lot and they work in many different ways. Um, I think as, as an operational structure for organizations, I think they're quite valuable because they define the boundaries of where an organization works. They also, they're more complex than kind of a set of morals. They're kind of a guiding structure that guides operation. So they help kind of people move forward. I do, however, like many other things, and many will disagree with these, they'll say these principles are universal. I argue that no, they're not. They're, they are a Western concept which has been exported from Europe along with um, the laws themselves. However, they, they can be translated to other things which are equally powerful. So the organisation I work for talks about them in a certain way where other organisations, as one delegate said to me, if I show up and tell someone that we're neutral and impartial, they're going to say, what the F is that? So instead, there are other related values that resonate just as well that we can also talk about. And they talk about trust. So we may not talk about like our neutrality is like, this is how we're going to behave. This is what we're going to do. That transfers across to broader ideas of trust. Trust us because we do what we say we'll do. So I'm big on the principles. I'm one of the people who falls in the camp of operationally, these are important guides to how we should act and how we should work because they work. At the same time, I acknowledge there's different ways to talk about them and use them and engage with different actors. Again, a broad answer to what's a fascinating question. Yep. I think we may have the topic for our next discussion because I think mm. we could go really oh. into that from different, different perspectives. Yep. So a huge thank you uh, to Joe, to Yvette and to Max for these really, really thought provoking uh, presentations and remarks. So a big thank you. Thank you. And a thank you to all of you who are joining us. We have our next Development Humanitarian Dialogue session on the 6th of December, which will be about volunteering and volunteerism in COVID-19. Um, but until then, thank you everyone and have a great evening. Cheers. Thanks all.